is an author of science and natural history books, and prolific contributor to journals such as Science, National Geographic, and Smithsonian. Her new book, Animal Wise, explores the once forbidden land of animal minds with scientists courageous enough to tackle the questions, what and how do animals think? She lives in Ashland and drove up here yesterday along with her husband, whose phone just rang. Uh, the writer, <laughs> Michael McRae, it's probably their dog because I know they have their dog, Buckaroo, out in the car, Buck travels with them everywhere, uh, their, their calico, I think, stay home. I'm not going to talk about the social life and ethics of whales <laughs> to the expert on that, but I think this is a great place to pick this discussion up because my book is truly about how biologists using a Darwinian approach have opened up our understanding of the emotions and thoughts of other animals, of, of their minds. Something that was denied for almost 100 years, uh, especially throughout the 20th century, um, there was an attitude that looked back at what Darwin had done and a disciple of his by the name of uh, George Romanes and they had written uh, books, both The Descent of Man and then Darwin did a book called The Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals, which were based on largely um, anecdotal observations, which are like a forbidden thing in science. You want to have experiments that show what an animal is capable of. But Darwin looked at all of these examples, especially similarities between, say, the expressions of dogs and ourselves, um, the way dogs would behave, that they would react, say, to an umbrella rolling across the lawn as if they knew that there was some agency that was pushing that, so maybe this is how the idea of religion developed. So he was looking for all of the things that we see in ourselves as having some kind of animal roots. As I said last night in my talk, all of our abilities have a uh, biological history, if you, know, if you will. It's, if you want to, evolution upsets you, uh, think of it that way. <laughs> so, but we do have a biological past, and it's not just in our physical form. And I think um, what I'll do is just to read a couple of passages. This is how I began my book. Just, in, and it was interesting to me to do this beginning like this, because I had started the first chapter a little differently, and my editor at Crown wrote back, and she said, this is very good, but what I want you to be is very overt. And uh, it's difficult as a science writer. We are taught to, uh, as scientists are, to be qualify things. You can't know absolutely some, these ideas are always being tested. So I took a deep breath and I wrote this sentence. And I remember looking at it for quite a while on the screen wondering, can I actually say this? This is the big sentence. Animals have minds, full stop. And I, I started thinking of all the things, you know, jellyfish, you know, <laughs> that people might say, well, they don't, you know, and, but I thought, okay, there, I did it, I did it. Uh, so to continue, they have minds, they have brains, and they use them as we do for experiencing the world, for thinking and feeling, and for solving the problems of life every creature faces. Like us, they have personalities, moods, and emotions, and I knew I was on solid ground about that because there are good scientific studies that establish all of those things. They laugh and they play. Some show grief and empathy and are self-aware and very likely conscious of their actions and intents. Not so long ago I would have hedged these statements because the prevailing notion held that animals are more like zombies or robotic machines capable of responding only with simple reflexive behaviors. And indeed, there are still researchers who insist that animals are moving through life like the half-dead. But they're so 1950s. <laughs> They've been left behind as a flood of new research from biologists, animal behaviorists, evolutionary and ecological biologists like Bill Ripple, comparative psychologists, cognitive ethologists, and neuroscientists sweep away old ideas that block the exploration of animal minds. The question now is not, do animals think? It is, how and what do they think? So you see in the papers, I mean, it's sort of a drum roll of new discoveries that you read about almost every, every other week. It seems uh, whales have accents and regional dialects, fish use tools, squirrels adopt orphans, 
uh, just a couple of weeks ago was that dolphins use their signature contact calls to actually call somebody else, you know, <laughs> not just to fool around. Uh, rats feel each other's pain, elephants see themselves in mirrors, all of these things which suggest that these animals have some sense of who they are as individuals, which is a difficult thing for us to accept. Now, Darwin, you know, he talked about, well, primarily about mammals and ourselves, but he even looked at insects, and he was quite willing to look at earthworms, and he did a very interesting experiment with earthworms. He gave them a choice of materials to use to block their little air holes, and he noticed that uh, he put out various things, some that were softer, some that had a little bit more irritating feel to them, and the worms were very selective in what they chose to block their tunnels. They didn't just grab anything. And he wrote a paper about it and said, uh, you know, nothing had surprised him more than the discovery of intelligence in what, of all things, earthworms. But we're still, as a society, grappling with what do we do about finding emotions and thoughts in our fellow mammals. And uh, this is one of the things that I struggled with as I wrote the book was how, if we consider that the other animals are separate beings, and even just mammals, or if we just you know, limit ourselves to mammals, how do we refer to them? How are they, what are they, persons or what? And, and I struggled with this, especially when I came, you know, had to use pronouns, and I wrote a paragraph about this. As I wrote the book, I struggled with the use of pronouns specifically whether to use who or that to identify an animal. Is it Alex the Grey Parrot that did these things, or Alex the Grey Parrot who spoke? It's a standard practice to refer to an animal as that, but after a while I found myself unable to do this. Alex was not a that, a thing or an object, any more than was Frodo the chimpanzee that I met, or Be Betsy the language proficient smart collie. In the end, I settled for a halfway measure, using who when writing about known individual animals and that for more general cases. It's not a perfect solution, but it does, does illustrate the larger question and issues we face as we begin to recognize fully the cognitive and emotional natures of animals. And another uh, scientist that I met took this to another level for me when I visited her. She had discovered pain in fish, which is something that most of us who like to eat fish and enjoy going fishing don't really want to know about. <laughs> so this is my experience of going to visit Victoria Braithwaite at uh, Penn State University. She had done this research originally in Scotland. She had received a grant. Um, she, she and her colleagues were interested in trying to improve life for hatchery fish. She said, we think of what happens to rats and chickens and, and uh, laboratory uh, monkeys and chimpanzees. Why not fish? Fish are animals too. And we look at what's happening to them in the fishery environment and we see that they have a very hard time. A lot of them end up with their fins and their tails being nibbled by other fish. When we release them in the wild, they have terrible rate of, of uh, <coughs> re you know, reproducing in the wild or surviving in the wild. 90, some even more than 90% of the salmon that were, are released in the wild in, in Scotland do not survive. There's no way that we can actually restore these wild populations unless we understand more about what fish need. So she thought it would be interesting to ask, why do the fish eat each other, attack each other, nibble each other's fins and tails? Are those particularly sensitive areas on fish? She applied to the British Council for a grant to investigate this. And they came back and said, well, actually what we'd like to know is, do hooks cause pain? <laughs> it's cut right to the chase. So she uh, did this study, and they published their first major article on the subject of these nerve fibers in rainbow trout in 2001. And they looked into it in 2001 and published their first major article in 2003. I met her at her campus office, and as she recited the early history of her group's studies, she called up on her computer the key paper that, they, that she felt best captured her team's findings. It was an enlarged photo of the face and head of a rainbow trout. 
she had placed small colored triangles, diamonds and hexagons along the fish's upper and lower lips, face and chin, near its gills and around its eyes, each pinpoint shape designating one of three types of pain receptors. Those are just the pain receptors on the trout's face and head, she said. We found 22 of them. The scientists also found the requisite nerve fibers for moving the cell's signals to the brain, proving that fish do have the physical and neural hardware to detect and process pain. There are a lot on their lips, I commented, trying to sound objective. <laughs> Although her diagram of places to pierce on a fish if you want to cause it pain had sent my objectivity right out the door, I'd grown up in Southern California, spent many summers hiking in the mountains with my parents who loved to camp and fish and taught me to do both. I'd hooked fish, mostly trout, at each one of the pain receptor points Braithwaite was now describing. I was what my husband and I jokingly called a heavy metal fisher, since I used fishing lures that sparkled like, sparkled like a minnow. They were usually armed with three sharp barbed hooks, a design, a design meant to catch and hold, even if the fish decided after taking a bite that it didn't really want this particular meal. Sometimes the hooks seemed to latch onto fish that might have just swum up to look at them, at the lure, rather. I'd hauled in trout that were impaled in their eyes, gills, cheeks, and chins. Had I really believed the fish didn't feel something when I pulled them flopping and wriggling, and yes, gasping for air from the water? I tried not to look at the photo and turned my attention to Braithwaite, who was eagerly explaining the details of each type of pain receptor. <laughs> so, she concluded brightly, I was able to tell the granting committee, yes, hooks hurt fish. Great, I said. <laughs> but you know, of course, that's not really what they were asking. What the committee and most of us really want to know is, do fish suffer when they sense that pain? Suffering is the cognitive side of pain. It's what we humans worry about. We don't like to cause unnecessary suffering. No, of course not, I agreed. Silently, I wondered if I would ever be able to go fishing again. No, of course not, the voice in my brain said. She clicked on the next Im image, which was an illustration of a fish's brain. She looked like a bundle of small potatoes. She pointed out that the various features and explained that the brains of fish had long been regarded as, regarded as missing many of the key structures that are found in the brains of mammals. Fish were thought to not have, a, have an amygdala, for instance, which is the area that helps process basic emotions, such as fear, and positive and negative rewards. Just a few years ago, however, an anatomist discovered that fish do have these structures in their brains. It was missed because fish's brains grow outward rather than inward, as ours do. All their special structures are on the outside, not the inside of their brains. She pointed to the amygdala on the screen. Now, this discovery of the fish's amygdala changes everything, she said, because similar cognitive structures have been found to work similarly in all vertebrates. It's why rats are often used as human surrogates to test psychobiological drugs, for instance. It means, she added, we can get at fish's inner states, at their feelings. What gives them a positive feeling? What puts them in a negative or depressed state? I imagine that a hook through the lip would probably do the latter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she said, but we need to take this one step further and see if they have a mental representation of this pain. And so she explains how she does this experiment and shows that yes, in fact, the fish actually do mentally experience pain. She then described giving her this talk about the fish brain and pain and all to a group of uh, psychologists and uh, doctors, human psychologists. And she'd given this talk a few weeks before my visit. She wondered, that some of them asked her at the end of her talk if she was going to ask next if insects suffer emotionally. My response was, well, shouldn't we have a look? Wouldn't it be interesting to know if insects have some kind of mental representation of pain? And if they don't, why not? It seems very unlikely that insects would have feelings, yet these kinds of emotions have clearly shaped us and other vertebrates. They help us to learn to protect ourselves, to say, oh, that really hurts. I really don't want to face that again. What's wrong with exploring this question in other animals? 
Darwin would have said nothing. He would expect to find some degree of our own senses of pain and suffering in other animals, from primates to insects. For him, all creatures were capable of intense emotions. Even insects could express anger, terror, jealousy, and love by their stridulations, which are the sounds crickets make by rubbing their back legs together and uh, could make other grating noises, he wrote, from distress or fear. He talked descriptively of the pain animals felt and their suffering, and he noted that if they suffered unduly, they became dispirited, depressed, and lethargic, just as the fish did in Braithwaite's study. Yet for much of the last century, scientists largely regarded cognition and emotion as separate entities. Since the 90s, however, the idea has been discarded, and these days the two are considered as inextricably linked, at least in us and our close primate kin. What if, as Darwin argued, this is true for many other types of creatures, even those that seem most driven by instinct, such as fish and insects? In untangling the evolutionary roots of cognition, researchers are inevitably drawn into the origins of our emotions as well. That's where I'll leave it because I think it leads to some interesting discussions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.